Well, very good morning today. Um, so today I want to share with you the concept of the glory of God. You know, I got this because I was reading Acts, uh, Luke, Luke chapter two. The shepherds were out in the, uh, in the in the open field, and suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared to them with the glory of God that dazzles their eyes. They were frightened. You see, the first response of us actually seeing the physical glory of God is that we are afraid. Why are we afraid of the glory of God? Because glory is so alien to us. Okay, some people go to, uh, what do you call this? Grand, Grand Canyon and saw the majesty of those beautiful mountains and clouds and creation of God. How many people give praise to God who created them, put them together? I'm sure the Christians do. I hope all Christians do. Uh, but majority do not. See, that's the issue. They see and they marvel and uh, walk away. And they may do it for a few more days. However, the point is they don't give thanks and appreciate. Now, the glory of God, now that beauty, Grand Canyon, that's a glory. It's nothing. It's such teeny compared to the glory of the Lord that is to come. You know, the thing is, the glory has come to the shepherds in the open field. The glory of the Lord has come to Mary. The glory of next, next month is uh, actually Christmas. So I'm speaking quite a lot about these things. The glory of the Lord is coming. It's not like it happened before and it's not coming anymore. And he said, oh, that's great. That's a his great historical, good for Mary, good for the shepherds, good for uh, Z uh, Elizabeth, Z Zachariah, and all these guys. Good for them. But you know, that happened before. We're going to move on in our lives now. I'm not sure, you know, it's not going to happen. I don't think I'm going to see it in my lifetime on earth and all this stuff. But no, wait a second. That glory is coming. That's the point. I don't want you to be blindsided thinking the glory of God is a nice story to read from the Bible. And then you just sort of walked away from it. Wait, no. Heck no. <laughs> you got to, we got to sort this out, okay? We're going to make sure that you really get this. That's right. You really get this. So that you don't, you don't fumble over it. When the time comes, because... Because it's going to cost you something. Or it gives you so much joy. Or you can be so afraid. So this is what's going to happen. Because Jesus is going to come back. And with His glory and mighty power. And then we will see who is with Him. You know, that glory that appeared to uh, the shepherds in the, in the open field. In the open field. In, uh, um, in, in, uh, to, to, <clears throat> to Mary. And also the glory, the Shekinah glory, the descendant of the temple, Solomon, people could stand inside. All that is glory from the same person. The Lord God, Yahweh, the Lord God, Jesus Christ. And the thing is, that glory is going to come back one more time. Well, I'm sure it will come back in, in a miniature ways in our life, daily lives. Um, the answer prayers. Oh, you see the glory of God, right? You just sense His love, joy, peace. That glory. You feel it. You sense it. Like God improved your health, healed you. You give thanks to God. You saw the glory of God. In a smaller scale. But the really ultimate. I'm talking about the ultimate glory coming. So that's why I'm going to talk to you, okay? So that is in a... Uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 23 to 28 or so. And he was saying to them, If anyone comes, wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. He must deny himself. What does deny himself mean? Abandon your own ambitions and goals? Carson's commentary. Take up the cross, imitate Jesus, and follow the will follow the will of the Father. Discipleship, okay, hold on. Discipleship demands 
a drastic shift in one's daily life to take on the mission of Jesus. You know, to take on the mission of Jesus, even to the point of death. That is discipleship. Discipleship demands a drastic shift in one's daily life in order to take the mission of Jesus even to the point of death. After Jesus' death, resurrection, ascension, ascension is a good word. Disciples are called to continue his mission by representing him here on earth, okay? Here on earth. So that is what's happening. Now, verse 24, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses it for my sake, this is the one who will save it. You either lose it or save it. <laughs> what does it mean? Okay. Uh, verse 24. This explains verse 23. Only those who, like Jesus, are willing to give up their own earthly desires and ambitions can obtain the spiritual blessings that Jesus' resurrection brings. Now, this is an important point. We need to get hold of. Deny ourselves means to give up our earthly desires and ambitions and obtain the spiritual blessings that Jesus' resurrection brings. This is a practical, hands-on, what does it look like kind of a statement. Give up your earthly ambitions. That's it. Give up your earthly desires and ambitions. What is your earthly desires? What is your earthly ambition? Give up to the Lord and, uh, and do what He calls you to do. And that is the most glorious thing. And I'm going to conclude later on and show you the glory that you're going to see by following this route. Okay? So, to obtain the spiritual blessings, you're going to give out your earthly desires and ambitions. There's a clear as, as, a, as a rock. Now, verse 25. For what good does it do to a person if he gains the whole world but loses or forfeits himself? Do you know what it means? Loses himself means he loses your eternal life. What good is it? What good is it? If you gain the whole world, it means you make a million dollars. A billion dollars, one hundred billion dollars, five hundred billion dollars. What's the richest man's worth? Elon Musk, I think like two hundred fifty million billion dollars. Right, there's a lot, right? The question is, what good is it? If you gain the whole world, if you got the the money of the whole world, but you lose your soul, you forfeit your soul. What good is it? Like these are ultra rich guys, go to the yacht, go to the yacht with uh, his girlfriend, like this is uh, Amazon boss Jeff Bezos. That's all right. Often shows up his, uh, you know, in his topless uh, muscle physique with his girlfriend lying on this uh, gigantic yacht and sunbathing, enjoying the Mediterranean waters or Florida waters or whatnot. Um, you know, you get the whole world. But if he doesn't, but, it, but he, if, he, if he doesn't give up his earthly ambitions and desires to follow Christ, he loses his soul. I'm not just talking about Jeff only, Bezos only, but the whole world. Every one of us, same thing. We may not be as rich as him, but in the same way, the principle applies the same way. If we don't do it now on earth, first, we don't know how long we're going to live. Trust that hopefully and prayerfully we can live a, a longevity life on earth and enjoying the blessings of God and giving up our earthly desires and ambitions and serving God. That's why serving God is the only rational route. If you study the Bible, it's the only way of life that makes sense. That's it. Only way that makes sense. No wonder the mon monasteries spring forth. 
in the European countries, in Europe, um, a few hundred years ago, uh, even in, uh, in the time of Augusta, it's like 300, 400 AD, they already started monasteries. Why? Because, because to give up the earthly desires and uh, ambitions. Now, how does it play out? How does it look like in our daily life? It doesn't mean that every one of us is going to go into monasteries. What happened to the world? We need people in the world. All of us are in the world. The past is in the world. God didn't call us back into the monasteries. Jesus' disciples all mingle in the world, not in the monasteries. But they live simply. There is no nothing luxurious in Peter's life. John's life, James, Peter, James, and John life oh Paul oh Paul come on give me a break Paul is the most on fire guy the most productive effective anointed apostle of all times sometimes he got shipwrecked floating in the ocean for for days for the sake of the gospel get flopped and I get get jailed sentenced most of the epistles were written by him while in jail <laughs> See that? He produced the best while in suffering persecutions. Anyway, the point here is that living a life full of earthly pleasures is not in congruence with what Jesus said and called us to do in Luke chapter 9. Okay, let's move on. He, that's why Jesus said, for what good does it do to a person if he gains the whole world but loses or forfeits himself? Verse 26. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and the holy angels. Wow. Three glory. The word glory is mentioned three times. Glory of, of Jesus. Glory of God the Father and the glory of the angels. Okay, so for whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man, meaning Jesus Himself, Jesus said, I will be ashamed of you if you are ashamed of my words. Christians, listen to me. Are you ashamed of God's word to stand in public place? To talk about in the correct way? I don't agree that you should go to the subway and preach. You know, believe in Christ, repent. That yelling is not going to do a lot of good. But it doesn't mean that we all keep quiet to our kitchens or dining tables about Christ. When we go out, we don't talk about Christ. We need to go out and witness, do good deeds to our society, to our neighborhood. I know that the church we go to now, they, they are having this, uh, what do you call this, a uh, neighborhood uh neighborhood counseling and helping the poor they're big on justice kind of thing all right um so the call to be faithful to jesus in the context a reference to his death okay to the point of death he said if you are ashamed of me i will be ashamed of you when i come wow big word piercing words who are you going to be ashamed of now? Are you going to be ashamed of Christ? Or going to be ashamed of the world? Are you so hooked winged, hooked into the pleasures of the world, that you can't any see any rationality anymore? You can't see anything that makes sense anymore. What's wrong with you and me? <laughs> so we need to repent and come. And this is change your mind, mindset. Okay, Carson says in verse 26, the call to be faithful to Jesus in the context of reference of his death and resurrection also appears in later confessions of faith, like 2 Timothy 2, 11 to 12. Let's take a look quickly on that one. Um, the statement is worthy. If we die with him, we also live with him. If we endure, we will reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. You see that? If we died with him, we will live with him. If we endure, 
if we endure, we will also reign with him. Enduring and reigning goes together. As Jesus is rejected by many on his way to the cross, his commentary, those who follow him are called to participate in this, this, this act of rejection. So Jesus got rejected. Jesus is calling us that in order to be his followers, be willing, be ready to be rejected by these people, by some of these people in this generation. It's okay to be rejected. You have not dropped into hell, but you should be shocked and ashamed and uh, and uh, and uh, disappointed and really depressed is when Jesus comes back with his glory, he's ashamed of you. Okay? So, as Jesus is rejected by many on his way to the cross, those who follow him are called to participate in this act of rejection. Wow, that's the Carson's word. So that's, that's amazing to, to, uh, to be willing to participate in this, this, uh, this act of rejection. So guys, if you ever get rejected by your friends because you believe in Christ and live a life of holiness and righteousness, bravo, praise the Lord, because you are actually participating in this act of rejection. It's fine. It's more than fine. It's glorious. It's glorious. Let me tell you this. Our society today is pretty hostile to our faith in Christ. So hold on to it. Never budge and keep going at it. It shall be beautiful, shall be glorious, shall be so wonderful and glorious, okay? Right, when it comes in His glory. So let me conclude now in Daniel 7, 13 to 14. I kept looking at the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he comes up to the Ancient of Days, and he was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, honor, and a kingdom. So that all the peoples, nations, and populations of all languages might serve him. His dominion is, is uh, his, an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. That is written like, I don't know. 4,000 years before Christ was born, okay? That is prophetically, prophetic picture of the kingdom that Jesus is going to build. It's going to last forever and ever. It's in His glory. Again, you know, Daniel 7, one more time. Then behold, one like a son of man was coming. It came in the ancient of day. He was given dominion, glory, you know, all this. So his dominion is everlasting dominion. That is the glory of Jesus. So make sure you're giving up your earthly ambition desires to serve Christ is to get ready to be part and see part of his glory his, when he comes back. That's what I'm talking about. I want to connect how people are faithful, are willing to give up these earthly attractions and go to the route of what, what Christ has called us, what God has called us to do, they will receive such blessings and joy, enjoyment and glory that's coming, that is coming. Amen.